Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for turning out this morning, and thank you for coming a week later. We thought last weekend, with the Fourth of July weekend, that we'd be better off putting all these things off one week. So we appreciate the good turnout this morning. Um, we're very excited to have uh, our present presenter this morning, Chris Gurgany. A lot of you know Chris from the museum. Chris is our museum executive director. He's been with us a little over two years now, and uh, Chris is very passionate about cars of all types. Uh, especially trucks, military vehicles, supercars. Well, I'm, I'm listing everything. I, mean, go, but I guess everything. He just loves cars. And the passion is reflected in what he'll be presenting today. You'll see how he's been in these cars. And like Chris will be the first to attest to, anybody who does a tread talk like we're listening to today learns so much ourselves when we put the information together that it's very hard to know what alley way to go down. There's so much information on these vehicles. So. I'm excited to hear this presentation this morning uh, on the Dodge Power Wagon, learning more about it, and I'm sure you will be too. So thank you all, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to Chris. All right, everybody. Thank you for coming out today. It's, it's a lot of fun to do these, and the longer you study for one of these, the more you realize you don't know. One of the realities that Doug and I deal with on a daily basis, sometimes hourly or by the minute, is errors in knowledge and you think you know about a vehicle and then you find another source that contradicts the previous source and a third source that has a completely different angle beyond that and by the time you're done you're more confused and ignorant than when you started the research that's how i feel on a lot of these research projects but i have a real passion from growing up and family history and always wanting a, a, a dodge power wagon and when i was interviewing for the job here, I was asked what vehicles that the museum didn't have that I think we should, and that was about second or third on my list. So when we were able to acquire one a year and a half ago, I was extremely thrilled. It's a fun vehicle, it's a crazy history, and it touches on so many different things that, as Doug said, military, work, civilian, power, you know. I mean, it's a Tim Allen special, more power. We get into this, what we're gonna be looking at is what's the history of the Dodge Power Wagon why are they so popular? What are they worth? How many generations and iterations of the vehicle are they? How did they get their name and what's really special about them? The history starts early in Dodge Brothers. They started making trucks and cars early on for the U.S. Army and by 1934 they de had developed the K39X-4 which was the Army's first 4x4 truck. The initial Dodge VC series military models had a lot in common with the T39 or 39T series pickups as well. Now, in 34, Dodge built the first drive system that allowed a vehicle to have the four-wheel drive turned off and on with a lever inside the cab. Before that, it was a, either on or, or off, basically. And that was at a half-ton cargo truck. 1940, Dodge received the contract to manufacture the 4x4 military trucks in various styles. The T202 series stock front end with civilian appearance started. You can see here you've got more of a rounded hood versus the more Jeep-like on a later model. The Dodge WC series were essentially built in two generations. From, early, from 40 to early 42, they made 82,400 of the half-ton 4x4 Dodge trucks. The, and I finally, Doug, found out an answer to this one. What's the difference between a VC and a WC? Well, the 1939 truck was called the TC. And the C was the lowest optioned model. It was just purely a work truck. For 40, they went up to the VC, and for 41 through the end of production in 45, they were the WC, or 47, excuse me, for the militaries. It was just a year code, but they kept the W instead of swapping it out for the, for the last few years there. From World War II weapons carriers to legendary work trucks. These start out as everything from ambulance to weapons carriers, personnel carriers, ambulances. They had 52 different models, 30 and a half ton, four by four, eight half ton, four by two, 12 three quarter ton, four by four, and two different models of the one and a half ton, six by six. All in production, all out in order from the military, they could order up what they needed. That's an insane amount. The, the Jeep, by con contrast, was so popular and so adaptable, but all the adaptions for the Jeep were done in the field, basically. 
there weren't many, there were, you had the base model and then they outfitted it as needed in the field, whereas this was a specialized heavier vehicle. The original civilian version is commonly called the flat fender power wagon. That was from 46 to 50. The power wagon was the first 4x4 medium duty truck produced by a major manufacturer in a civilian version. In this case, what they call the, the medium duty is actually a full ton. That's what the first trucks in all of them subsequently were rated at through the first three series. It was marketed as the WDX truck. Again, the W from the military. Until about 60, it was internally known by its engineering code of T137. And a lot of aficionados of the power wagon still refer to the first two generations or three generations as the T137. Kind of sounds like Terminator, doesn't it? Following Chrysler Corporation's policy of badge engineering, these were marketed worldwide under the Fargo and DeSoto brands from Chrysler. Where'd it get its name? We have this here, it's in this little stand up right here. Thanks to Mr. Bud, he donated that to the museum as part of the explanation. According to some, and there's a lot of dispute on this, it was named after Power Wagon Magazine. Now the funny thing about that is that in 1900, the Grabowski brothers decided to build their own work trucks. Very early, they prototyped it, and so by 1902, they started to produce the Rapid Truck, which is what you see here on this postcard. The company was eventually acquired by General Motors in 08, and Grabowski resigned to establish a new truck manufacturing venture that also faded by the 20s. Pretty typical early story, but it is the first power wagon. The earliest known power wagon still in existence is this one. It's number 12. 1946, first year, 12th truck off the line. Number 12 was bought by the Michigan State University Agricultural Engineering Department, and it served there for about 30 years before being sold into private hands. The current owner um, is an MSU uh, grad who is trying right now he works for one of the big three car manufacturers in Michigan, but he's trying to figure out the difference between preservation and restoration. What's best for the truck and what's best for history. And let me tell you on a side note, that is a major argument for us here as well. And one that we do, I think I'm okay to say this, Doug, we do want some feedback on. There's a lot of argument in the automotive world, museum automotive world especially, on what is best for the vehicles. Is it better to show you a pristine example that has been restored lovingly to what it should be? Or is it better to see the bumps and tears and the stories and scars? So we're gonna be doing some things over the future, probably launching a couple of surveys, I expect, to find out what people think. What do you wanna see in our museum? Because that's as important as what you can see in the museum. So it's called automotive archeology span now, believe it or not, but that is something that we struggle with, I struggle with on a daily basis. Do we want an unrestored, survivor or do we want to show you the best of the best? And I don't have a good answer. I may never have a good answer. This is an original 1946 Power Wagon advertisement. Note the hyphen. That lasted about a year. They, in 47 or 48 they took that off. And, but this was created to compete with military-based Ford and Marmon Harrington trucks and GMC trucks. All weather enclosed cab, eight foot crew bo cargo box, contained a 230. The initial ones had a smaller, but pretty quickly they upgraded to the 230 straight six in them. And the winch on ours, I've s told several of you wrong, I apologize. Again, we're always finding mistakes. Initial sources I'd read said that's a 30,000 pound winch. They're actually rated at 7,500 pounds, but it's still a huge amount of pull. Different power wagon series. Right at the end of World War II, they started building trucks. Number 12 was built in January of 46, but they did build a few in the very end of 45. They had a number of series in them. As you can see here, this is a 46. The earliest ones um, were a little more, slightly more military, but they quickly adopted the cab from their 39s and the, and the nose cone, where if you've seen the, the military one earlier with the flat Jeep style, 
they went with a, a little more curved and Art Deco-ish kind of cab on them. The second series was 51 to early 56. That's what we have, our 51 right here. The biggest differences on these are the slightly curved fenders. Now there was a curve to the earlier ones, but these curved down. Another difference on this is that the sides of the better pressed steel. Another thing you find on these that's different is the 45 degree angle of the rolled outer edges of the bed on top. That's a sign that it's a second series. The gauges will tell you in a first series, it had two clusters of two gauges on either side of the wheel, one here, one here. For the, 40, for the second and third series, they go to a four gauge cluster to the right of the, of the speedometer. Our truck, I found out through this research, has an error in it. It's got the wrong gauge cluster. The cluster in this is a third series because it's got a black background. This should be gray or silver for a, for a second series. So, you know, again, as Doug said, we have rabbit holes everywhere that we run through and we're constantly finding something that we didn't know. But the other thing with the first series, the, if you want to know the lettering and the numbering on the gauges is on the glass, not on the face of the dial or the, or the meter. So, Little differences for the third series, it goes to the black gauges, which is what ours has in a four, four gauge cluster. Third series, as I said, you go to the all black background. You've got several differences here. This one has three slightly curved stake holders on each side of the bed. They go to a square stake holder on three of them on each side of the bed. It's got the, as I said about the that it's got the MP420 synchronized transmission in it and the bed sides from the rear if you look it's flat they've got rounded outer curves on them but it's it's flat topped they also did a third series export where the third series ran from late 56 into 71 the export ran from 57 to 78 this is a 1978 macho power wagon special series a 1975 looks a lot like a Little Red Express or a standard step side, but that was some of the different models that they had at that time. And fourth series, 2005 to 2009, they only made 4,629 of these in those years. Not a real heavy or high amount of production. This is a suddenly part of the Ram series of Dodge. And with the fourth series on through the fifth even, one of the things you find is it's now a badge and accessories package rather than a pure truck as the power wagon. The only way you can get a power wagon from the fourth and fifth series is to buy a Ram 2500 and upgrade with that package. So it's, it's the badging, it's basically the same truck but it's got the power wagon. It is more focused and tuned for off-road use and for heavier use than a t even a typical 2500, but it is that's what it's supposed to be and that's what they're trying for here. Fifth series. The only thing you can do here again is a 2500, but in the fifth series you had to buy a crew cab. Four doors or no power wagon. Again, it's got, these actually have an 11,000 pound winch on them. It's got the oversized 30 inch tires. It's got the trim package, and again, you've got a truck tuned for off-road use. Heavy construction, pulling, working. Because let's face it, what was the power wagon for but for work? It was, you know, it was a, not a status symbol We'd, like our trucks today. It was a tool, and what a tool it was. Power wagon accessories and options. This is where the, the craziness is limited. Unlimited, excuse me. The options unlimited. They, these were designed to do one thing, work and work hard. The first three years you had five colors and in the next uh, nine years you had six. After that, in the third, fourth, fifth series, you could get any color that you wanted that Dodge produced, but they were very limited. I've never found an exact color, so I don't know that, I don't think any of these are Sea Wolf Submarine Green, but red, dark blue, yellow, and Dodge Truck Dark Green. This one here has the optional swivel middle on it. Like a Mercedes Unimog, you could use the swivel middle and, and get everything you needed for it. And get up through the rougher terrain, through the, the ditches and the gullies. 
accessories. What's crazy about the Power Wagon is a number of things. First of all, it has front and rear PTO. We do not have a rear long PTO shaft with ours. It's, a, it's something we can get, but we also don't have the things we need to run off of it. Our winch is a direct PTO driven winch straight off of the transfer box. So that is there with the shaft, but these were made to do, I know somebody earlier said they were made for forestry. That's about a th eighth of what they were made for. They were heavily used in construction, forestry, um, civilian use, um, utilities, farming, you name it, this thing could do it. They had the hydraulic lift that could be mounted to the back. With that, you could add plows, bush hogs, saws, post hole diggers. This is the six by six version with a wrecker crane on it. This is a utility pole installing truck. Fire truck, you can do pump and roll straight off the PTO. So very, very adaptable trucks. The one, the one attachment I could not find a picture of that I've heard of, I think I saw one once, was they had a backhoe attachment where you could literally do heavy construction with these things. One of the things that we were, I was, we were fortunate to find and find two of, this is actually a print copy of the 1950 Dodge Power Wagon um, advertisement, the, the truck brochure that you can go through and see what attachments and what information was available. The one up here is a 47 copy that I found online. But what this truck will do is crazy. It's got the pulling power, one of the big advantages is portable power. You've seen pictures with the Model T with the wheel off running a, a belt to run chop saws, timber saws, bush hogs, whatever. The, with the rear PTO shaft, you could mount a heavy pulley to that and run the same things while driving the truck. The carrying power. These things are nuts on that. This one here well, they're rated at, like I said, about one ton. These trucks had a total gross vehicle weight with the nine inch wide, eight ply 16s on it of 8,700 pounds. The truck weighs a little under 6,000. So it could gross vehicle haul weight of two ton. I wouldn't want to do it. It's already rough enough, even empty, but with the gross vehicle weight allowances on these, they could go anywhere and do anything, and that's why the people relied on them. Pull a plow, pull a disc. Here's an uh, illustration of the optional um, hydraulic two-point lift system in the back. This truck will do 45 mile an hour. You could drive it to the field, you could plow the field, you could take it home, hose it off, and drive it to church that night if you needed to. It was a do-all, be-all, and that's a lot of the reason why it's so hard to find these in anything other than horrible condition. They were made for, and every one of them went through heavy use, whether it was civilian, whether it was um, with the government use, number of other things, they all were seriously abused trucks. Post hole digger, here's your ground scoop. You can use some leveling. They've got back blades. Again, like I said earlier, a backhoe. What do you need it to do? Power and utilities with the winches, and you could mount an even bigger winch in the back than the 7500. You can, do, you can drill the post holes, you can drill wells, you can drill oil, you can put the posts in the hole. You can go through the swamps quite easily because of the high rise and the real good reliability. Pull logs, cut logs, lift steel I-beams in building construction. There's a generator and a welding system portable for out in the fields. Did you ever think about using it as a street sweeper? Fire truck, school bus, ambulance. That brings us to the stepchild, I guess. This is a concept truck that Dodge developed for the 99 year that went to a number of the Motoramas and motor shows, but was never produced. 
if you really look, look at the curb on these. The fact that it's got the 11,000 pound winch, but it's got the curved wide fenders, the big tires, it's off-road oriented. It's a nice looking truck. You've got the louvers, everything that emulates what's on, this, on the truck that we have here. Our power wagon. We purchased this in December of 21, and we were very fortunate to get it. Um, Doug made some very excellent moves when we found out about it and was able to acquire it. This truck, our truck, was, in, was a victim of the Canadian truckers strike and blockade, as well as some paperwork issues. And if you want to see Doug go nearly insane, this truck almost drove him over the edge, I'm afraid. The only thing that kept us sane was we got a really good value out of it. Um, it took about three and a half months to get here from Canada. It was on an online Sotheby's auction. And so we were glad. We didn't have to have it in right away. And storing it away from, from public eyes is a lot easier when it's not in the country, let alone in the building. So it worked for our advantage at that point. One thing I'd like to touch on right now, too, is how, and it's a question we get daily, sometimes hourly on the floor, how do we acquire our vehicles? And Doug will give you a very lengthy and wonderful explanation, but I'll give you just a real bare bones. We buy them wherever we can find them. This one here was at a public online auction through Sotheby's. The, the Cord and the Peerless, we purchased through a nationally known major specialty car dealer. Uh, we buy a lot from private individuals. Quite frankly, that's our preferred method. It's, it's better for us, it's better for the seller because you're not paying the auction fees. You have to if you take one to auction. And so that's, you know, when, whenever possible, we're very happy to do that. But they come from all over the country. Some come from town, some come from Canada. Heck, we bought a tractor in Italy that we'll talk about later. But that's where we acquire them. And we, we work, Doug works really hard in negotiating a price that's fair to the museum and our collection and our needs as a 501c3 not-for-profit, as well as for the seller. So we try and keep a fair balance for everybody. We're not out to gig anybody or cheat anybody. We work very hard not to. But we also try not to be cheated either. And, you know, we're very lucky to have Doug and his research abilities on that. He does a great job. Ours is a four-speed manual. Now, one thing I want you to look at when we get inside is all the different levers in the floor. There are five of them right beside, between the driver and the passenger. You've got your high-low selector. You've got your four-speed shift manual. You've got the emergency parking brake, and you've got two PTO takeoff levers in there to actuate as well. Um, the only thing I've driven that was even crazier than that was my grandfather's Unimog several years ago, and it had like eight. I still don't know what three quarters of them did. Gross vehicle weight of 5,900, 126 inch wheelbase. Originally cost you $2,065. One of the questions that always comes up is what's it worth? Right now, the last few auctions I've watched on trucks of close to or similar condition to ours, it's about a $150,000 truck. Again, they were so abused. If you find one in a farmer's field and there's anything left of the floor pans, there's anything left of the fenders, you call it a great find. These, I've seen them where well, daylight not only gets in them, but there's nowhere to hide in the shadows. There's not much left to them. When they use them for, for civil patrol or they used them in street sweepers or on farms, again, they're a tool. They're there to be used and abused. And so that's what they were. But that's also why we like them so much. That truck will go anywhere a Jeep will go. That truck will climb a hill. That truck will go through the water. It will do anything you needed it to do. And it'll get your groceries or take you to church or whatever else you need to do. But first and foremost, it's a work truck. Yeah, here's what I was talking about on the, on the gross vehicle weight capacities on this. It just, it's amazing how much these trucks will do. We said we had a lot of sources and a lot of research on these, and, and we do. This is just kind of a list of some of the sources I used. This, I think says Power Wagon, but it's a bad picture, but even not, 
It's a Dodge 2500 hold, holding a D2 or D3 Caterpillar. Not happily, obviously, but it is on there. And they, a yeah. couple other things I'd like to cover real quick before we leave. I want to say thank you to all our staff. Doug's heavily involved in the vehicles. Sherry runs our event center in front of house as director of programming and events. I can't do it without Aiden, who's our photographer and events assistant, and any of my front end staff as well. And especially, I want to also say the same to our unpaid staff, our volunteers. Many of you are in here today, and we appreciate you. We cannot run this operation without any of you. On that note as well, nobody has adopted our power wagon yet. That's one of our sponsorship programs. We don't hit up for a lot of money. I think all of you that are around here normally know that. But that is one way to support us. The vehicles that have the red down below them are available for adoption. If the sign is, is yellow, is the gold, that means it's been adopted for a year. So we rely on that to help keep the, month, keep the museum going to our acquisitions for everything we do. So that's another thing just to keep in mind. If you want to adopt our power wagon, doesn't mean you get to take it home. You can't drive it, you know, but your name's out there as a proud supporter of the museum and that means everything and helps us as we operate. And with that, I will take questions. I was good. Yes, sir. So this probably not only applies to this truck, but the rest of the vehicles as well. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes you take vehicles out. Mm -hmm. Vehicles, in order for them to be maintained, they need to be exercised. Yep. Um, do you have like a normal schedule for that for the vehicles, or how do you exercise a truck like that? That I'm hoping to exercise pretty soon. But y'all like it so much on the floor, and that's part of the balance that that Doug and I both struggle with is, you know, we need we do exercise them. Last week we had two of our vehicles out um, in Wamigo alone for the Walter P. Chrysler show. We had our 2020 C8 Corvette as well as our 58 uh, Edsel Pacer convertible out there. Next time, I don't know what we'll select. Some of them are going to get exercised for our members in October. Uh, we're having our second annual member ride along experience one evening. I don't remember the date, and it's not 100% set in stone but that will be coming out really quickly too. And if you're a member, you can come and have a free ride along on, I don't know, two, three, five of our vehicles, depending on what, what we have that's available. Nick exercises our mechanic and without Nick, and I failed to mention him earlier and I apologize for that, none of this stuff would run. Not as well as it does. He spends 40 hours a week going through these, working on them, keeping them working, keeping them running and steering us in the right direction. In the last two years at Nick's recommendation, we store everything with racing fuel because it's completely stable. We can get three to five years, according to Nick, out of that without it deteriorating, whereas if you're putting Stabil or Seafoam Green into non-biomass fuel, you get three to nine months typically, or biomass fuel, you're in trouble in about a month and a half, two months, depending on what vehicle. So that's the kind of things we do to keep it going. But we do try and take everything out, everything in here, with usually an hour or two of Nick's time, we'll run and run right because he maintains them. We do start them up, but we don't drive them as much as we'd like to. But the other side of that coin is what it takes once we've used it. If Doug and I take something out just to drive or to take to an event, and we, you know, people are like, you can drive anything you want. Yeah, we can, but we don't. Because we know that when we get back, Nick's gonna have a list from us of things we may find that are wrong. And even more importantly, Nick's gonna spend five to ten hours of his very valuable time redetailing it so that it looks like it does. You know, we get in beautiful vehicles, Nick makes them even better. And out of respect for him being a single man shop, out of respect for the work he does, and trying not to drive him off, we're careful about when we choose to take something out. Because it does involve far more than anybody ever thinks about. When they were made and mm -hmm. sold in the those early years, <clears throat> was there a 